Hi guys, so today I'm going through the Preterist Doctrine of the Last Reform Last Resurrection <coughs> and how it's been fulfilled in uh, the first century and uh, yeah so I kind of made a PowerPoint presentation and we're just going to be going through it uh, for those of you who didn't get the actual copy of it um, maybe just ask me and I could email you the PowerPoint itself so you can even email me I'll try to put in the details below the video on YouTube <coughs> or you can ask me on my Facebook page group sharp and active and uh, Yeah, so there's a lot of people that, like, you start talking about preterism, how it's, everything's been fulfilled, and they'll mention, well, what about being caught up in the air to meet the Lord? And uh, and then I'll say, well, yeah, I believe that's been fulfilled, and, and people will, well, I disagree. And uh, so, and that's because they don't understand a lot of, or they haven't heard of even, a lot of what I'm about to show you. And uh, this, and so basically this understanding of the spiritual nature of <clears throat> the new covenant, the kingdom, and life. So, just trying to make sure this is going here. So here's the first slide, this is the last resurrection. And uh, I'm just going to get it set up here. So I can manage it a bit better. Okay. So this is my introduction. We'll see if I can just get myself out of here. <laughs> it says there... So... Introduction. There's... So this is... I basically talk about how people think the resurrection of 1 Corinthians 15 is future to us uh, nowadays, 2,000 years after it was written. And they'll basically say it was kind of, it's going to, kind of a mysterious sort of rapture thing that looks like it's going to happen. And there's going to be physical bodies rising out of physical graves, or somehow the molecules will come together and Jesus will come on a cloud. And they take other verses literally as well and say that all people will somehow see this physical body of Jesus. Um, I don't believe that. I think that's hard to understand. And that's, um, I don't think that fits in with the rest of the New Testament, what it has to say about the timing of those events and what Jesus said about the fulfillment of those Old Covenant uh, promises. And resurrection is found in the in the promises to Old Covenant Israel. And that's something I feel like a lot of futurists kind of uh, ignore in some ways. Uh, today we will reveal the mystery of God, or godliness, which would be revealed by the last ref resurrection. This would also be fulfillment of the last three feasts that I'm doing another PowerPoint on, <coughs> because that's when uh, this resurrection would happen. Uh, this is one of the main doctrines of full preterism. Our uh, covenant eschatology is what some people call it. Uh, parse preterists do not generally agree with this as being fulfilled. Full preterists are often accused of being false teachers uh, because uh, futurists, who are the ones uh, kind of pointing out the issues with preterism, know that there's a connection between Jesus' second coming and the last resurrection. They're like, well, that's the time of the resurrection. So how can we believe that the uh, return of Christ already happened? And you can't separate the tribulation from the last resurrection. You can't separate uh, the return of Christ uh, from the last resurrection. And uh, so that's something we're going to see more and more.
Keep in mind, this is an advanced Bible study, especially when it comes to understanding Hebrew metaphors in first century context. Anyways, you guys can read through this yourself. You can pause the video if you want. I'm just going to kind of talk about what I'm, what's on each page. He says, the first century church did not have the New Testament. So that's another Bible study. Um, you can go through John 5.39. Jesus says, uh, whoever, you study the Bible diligently, you study the word diligently, but you refuse to come to me to have life. And he was speaking to the Jews about the Old Testament. And uh, so Jesus, we should be able to under, we should be able to see him all over the Old Testament, but nowadays people don't see him all over the Old Testament uh, because they don't understand some of the language and how it was fulfilled, being fulfilled in the first century. So watch out for audience relevance in the Bible verses I'm going to give you. Watch out for time statements, location, context, and la Hebrew language. So the exaggerated Hebrew language. Right, the Hebrews were very energetic people, not like today where we kind of sit around uh, on our couches with our TVs and stuff. They weren't like that. They were very much farmers and go-getters and going about doing their thing. Uh, the mystery ought to be understood by everyone. Uh, this, yeah, this is a mystery. This was the mystery that was being revealed, that was hidden in the Old Testament. It was being revealed to the wise, and the wicked would not understand it. Uh, that's in Daniel 12. It talks about the resurrection, and then it explains that in verse 10. Uh, so this can change the world, because it, it actually shows us uh, the path to eternal life, immortality, the secret of immortality. And uh, the Bible is actually, it's, it's actually interesting. The Bible is actually very clear what the mystery is. Um we kind of have made it literal and physical and posited it in our future when we don't understand some of the language around it. Uh, confirm what I'm saying for yourself. Tell me if what I'm saying is something wrong, that you may know something I haven't heard of, right? So Jesus says, seek and you will find, right? Whoever obeys my teaching will know the truth and the truth will make them free. So like, I'm not afraid if you know something I don't know. I'm not afraid of truth, you know, even if hell is real, eternal conscious torment, and you have something to say about that that proves that, uh, uh, show it to me. Email me about it, we can talk about it. Uh, if you see, think I'm saying something that doesn't make sense to you, uh, I would hope that you could share all good things with those who are teaching you, right? Okay, let's go to the next slide. In the beginning was death, right? In Genesis is the story of the fall of Adam. Uh, in chapter 2, 17, he says, In the day of your eating of it, you're going to die, right? So the question I ask is, did Adam die that day? And this is, this is a question that's kind of explained a lot more in uh, actually Daniel Rogers' book, the Last Enemy in the Triumph of Christ. It's a, or you can get Don K. Preston's book, Daniel 12, 2, Resurrection, Fulfill the Future. So two books I've read that explain this idea very well. Um, so basically, you have to answer this with yes, because God cannot lie. So Adam did die that day. And it's true that he did because God said he would. And therefore, the nature of Adam's death was being an outcast, separated from God. Or you can answer no, which is basically the wrong answer, because God cannot lie. Uh, the nature of death is spiritual, and God is making the end known from the beginning. So this is Isaiah 46, verse 10, which basically says that. God makes the end known from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. Uh, this is a theme continued throughout the Bible, as we will see. So there's the insistence that we're going to deal with is in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 and 55. It says, The perishable puts on the imperishable, the mortal puts on immortality. 
Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? So people, they look at full preterists and they're like, how can this be fulfilled? Uh, these verses are often seen in connection to the end of the millennium in Revelation 20, 21, and 22. The common thought is physical death and is swallowed up and Jesus has not put all enemies under his feet yet. He has been tarrying for 2,000 plus years. So the common thought is physical death, then of course this has not been fulfilled. But as we just saw with Adam, that it was not going to be physical death, it was going to be spiritual death. So we know that that was the death that was being swallowed up. And it was uh, the sin that was going to be dealt with. And when, yeah, of course, when you read these, those words with the Western mind and you don't understand the nature of life or death, then, of course, this, this language will sound like it has not been fulfilled because just look around you. Um, but Jesus says in Luke seventeen twenty, nobody's going to say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is within you, right? So this is a uh, spiritual life. It's within you. And it's the same with the clothing. Would uh, You'd be clothed with this immortality. It would be a spiritual sort of immortality. <clears throat> so he says... Uh, a few verses earlier, in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, he says, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And this is about the same subject of death being swallowed up. So the audience relevance. Who is the we in this sentence above? I've I've heard many futurists read this, and they're like, What? We, we've not all slept. We, we, aren't, we haven't been changed, right? Um, in other words, they put themselves into the text instead of considering that this is a letter written in the first century and we are reading somebody else's mail. Uh, it was a different age. We are now in, there's age to come. This was the end of the age of the law of Moses. And, and uh, if we're in the same age as these people, then the law of Moses still has not passed away. Let's not forget the audience relevance, right? It can only be reasonably referring to the Corinthian Christians who were receiving Paul's letter in Corinth in the first century, AD 53 to 57, just 13 years before the burning of the temple in Jerusalem. So this change was something actually, it's only reasonable that it could be referring to them because you can see this change happening little by little and fulfilling Jesus' words. Uh, concerning the Great Commission. And then in Colossians 1, verse 6, we see that it was bearing fruit throughout the whole world. So being changed is a process of bearing the fruit of the Spirit. And it is the part of the work of the Spirit. And it was fulfilling this prophecy of the pur purification of the saints at the end of the Old Covenant age. So, uh, so what does sleep really mean? So in the New Testament, sleep actually means physical death for the Christian. Whereas those who are not, who weren't Christians were considered dead already. <clears throat> in Genesis 2.21, says the Lord caused the man, Adam, to fall into a deep sleep. So Adam was the first to sleep and and out of his rib, Eve was born, right? And uh, so all of this had to be fulfilled. God was making the unknown from the beginning. Uh, the death did reign from Adam till Moses. Even upon those not having sinned in the likeness of Adam's transgression, who is a type of him who is coming. So... <coughs> Death reigned from Adam to Moses, right? Was this physical death? No. It was spiritually separated from God. They had evil thoughts continually. And that's why this flood came. <coughs> and that's that was this uh, se separation from God. And 515, not as the offense, so also as the free gift 
For if by the offense of the one the many did die, much more did the grace of God through Jesus Christ abound. Right. So the point here is Jesus was fulfilling the opposite pattern of Adam. He was the last Adam, as it's seen in Romans 5. Jesus' second coming is the last Adam who was the antitype of Adam. So there's a term called types and shadows in the Old Testament. It's a technical term to describe something that is uh, a kind or a type or a shadow of the reality or the fulfillment of things in the Old Testament. For example, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, but then what actually happened is uh, God would sacrifice Jesus on the cross. Uh, Jesus' second coming is the last Adam, right? Who was the last Eve? The New Covenant Jerusalem and believers. So you can read that for yourself. So just more about sleep on this uh, page. And it's explaining how Eve was the New Covenant and how Eve was uh, born out of Jesus being crucified and Adam, how Jesus was fulfilling what Adam did. So this is why sleep in the in the New Testament is what believers were using in their letters to describe the physical death. And uh, they didn't desire to judge anyone according to the flesh, even Jesus Christ. So there's all these examples uh, you can find for yourself if you just look up the word sleep. Uh, you can use eSword or you can just look it up on Google. <clears throat> Paul said we will not all sleep in 1 Corinthians 15, 51. The Corinthians would be changed. If we look at Jesus' words to help us confirm audience relevance, Jesus says in Matthew 16, 27, the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father with his messengers, then he will reward each according to his work. In verse 28, he says, there are certain of those standing here who shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his reign. So it's very similar language to 1 Corinthians 15. There's some people who wouldn't taste death or they wouldn't sleep, but they would be changed. And that was basically equivalent of seeing the Son of Man coming in his reign. Jesus' own words tell us is about to come and in glory, and those standing here would see it. Very similar to the yeah, what I just read, basically. So, so the nature of the second coming was spiritual. In the same verses, we know it would be in the glory of the Father. So we're going to be focusing more on the Father in this one. I focus more on the glory in my Acts 1 series. So in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Then the end, verse 24, when he may deliver up the reign to God and even the Father. This does not mean Jesus is not king. It means he came in the same glory as he spoke of, which he prayed for. He says in John 17, verse 5, when he's praying, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. The question is, did the glory Jesus had before the world began mean he would come in a literal, physical body? No, right? In Colossians 1, it talks about Jesus created the whole world and that he was in the, that was the glory he had with the Father. And uh, Jesus, right, did he have a physical body when he was creating the planet Earth and the stars and the moon? Right, I don't think so. It talks about the Spirit was hovering above the waters. So I don't think that was a physical or literal sense, uh, the glory he had with the Father. 
and throughout the Old Testament you can see how the Father came in glory and in judgment on those cities in the Old Testament. So now we're going to be focusing on glory. I think so I might have made a mistake there. We were focusing on Father <laughs> as the glory of the Father, but now we're going to be focusing more on the glory. In Greek, doxa, or I don't know how you say it, I just read it. <laughs> it le literally means it evokes good opinion, and that something has inherent intrinsic worth. Uh, I think the earlier definitions of glory meant it was like common belief or common opinion. And that's something, right, is, is weighty later on. The glory was increasing in the body of Christ in the first century, just like Noah was exalted high above the earth during the flood. So here I just draw some parallels from Luke, which was also talking about the destruction of Jer Jerusalem and uh, these changes that were going to happen. You have the signs in the heavens, which is represents the ecclesiastical Jewish authorities, uh, the, the children of the covenants. <coughs> the moon could be like the old covenant, the sun is like the new covenant, because there is in Romans 13, I think it is, talks about like the the night time as being the old covenant <coughs> or that dark dark generation where they were going to shine as the stars and the new covenant would be the sun um in genesis 37 verse 9 with the dream of joseph he sees the sun moon and stars bowing down and his father interprets that as his mother father and brothers <coughs> you can also read uh adam clark's commentary in matthew 24 29 Uh, the powers of the heavens would be authorities. I uh, posted that there. So coming in a cloud would be, you can see similar language found in the Egypt's destruction in the 7th century BC in Isaiah 19, verse 1. Uh, they would, they would uh, lift up their heads because their redemption was drawing near. This would be like the fulfillment of the Day of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. <clears throat> it puts time between those two feasts or those two days. And you can see his coming in a cloud would mean him coming like in the Law and the Prophets in fulfillment of those things in becoming as... as it, uh, within believers, as in a mirror, and we'll see that more. Uh, and it would be with glory, because he would be glorifying himself in his disciples. So the glory of the body would be spiritual. In 1 Corinthians 15, 41, there's one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and different even from star to star, which is a cool statement because it, mean, it mean, talks about us as we are different uh, even from one another uh, with our different giftings, and we are all unique. <clears throat> and he says it's the same with the rising again of the dead. Sown in corruption is raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory, it is sown in weakness, raised in power. Right, Jesus, when in the wilderness for 40 days, came out in the Holy Spirit in power. It is sown a natural body, is raised a spiritual body. So the spiritual body, that is not something physical, right? The seed is not like the fruit, So also it has been written, the first man, Adam, became a living creature. The last Adam is for a life-giving spirit, right? The last Adam, Jesus, 
is for a life-giving spirit. So, like Adam, he uh, he slept and Eve was born. Well, Jesus, he was crucified in fulfillment of that. And there's a life-giving spirit was born. Right? This uh, It wasn't necessarily born, but he was raised up in the spirit. And that's, you can see that in First Peter. Where he says that. Romans 8, 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of the present time, right? So the trials, the, tri the great tribulation, partial predators all agree it was happening in the first century. And uh, I know like Bethel Church endorses Jonathan Welton and he teaches, he released his book Raptureless and Raptureless.com and that teaches that the great tribulation was happening in the first century. You can look up Gary DeMar for more partial preterist stuff um, if you want. So those sufferings in the first century were not to be compared with what the glory about to be revealed in us. So partial preterists make a big deal of that uh, suffering in the first century, but they don't really make a big deal about the glory that was revealed in those believers in the first century. Right? And it's because uh, it's because uh, we want, we like to see the fruit, we like to witness, we like to see it, we just so badly want to see it. But uh, Jesus is like, it's nobody's going to say here it is or there it is. You're not going to be like, oh, look around you. Here's the kingdom of God, right? But it would be revealed inside of those Christians in the first century who were, <coughs> who knew the truth and the truth that made them free. So if the truth is here, I would say the kingdom of God is here. This is the same about to be from Matthew 16, 27 and 28. So he uses the same word about to be in Matthew 16. In Romans 8 he says about to be. Right, and this would be revealed, and that's where we get the book of Revelation. It would be a re revealing of these things, and that's what the new book of Revelation is about: is this resurrection out of the death of the old covenant and into the life of the new covenant. Note the location of the glory being revealed is in us and not in a cloud. Luke seventeen twenty right? This is where he, Jesus talks about the location of this kingdom. The word kingdom is authoritative, and it would it would be within believers. In other words, in Proverbs, it talks about uh, a man who has control over himself is greater than him who takes over a city. So that's what we see with Jesus in John chapter six: is he doesn't want to reign on a physical, literal throne, but he's going to reign within the hearts of believers. Right? Our war is not with flesh and blood. Nor shall they say, here it is or there, for the reign of God is within you. Colossians one twenty six. The secret was hidden for ages in the Old Testament times, from the generations, but now, first century, when Colossians is written, 62 AD, it was manifested to his saints. So manifested is, uh, it was made real. You can see that in Matthew chapter 7. He says, you'll know them by their fruit. And the fruit of the Spirit is righteousness, peace, and joy. So this was the, the evidence that they had for uh, the glory of God, the divine nature, it's called in Second Peter chapter 1. To whom God did will to make known what is the riches of the glory of this secret among the nations, which is, what? Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, the glory that would be revealed would be within believers, would be manifested to his saints. Right? The w wise would understand this resurrection 
The wicked would not understand this resurrection. 1 John 3, verse 2. Beloved children of God, are we? It was not yet manifested what we shall be. What we have known, and we have known that if he may be manifested like him, we shall be, because we shall see him as he is. Right? So how is it that you will manifest in John fourteen twenty two? I think Judas asks Jesus, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? I just want to look at this verse, actually, again. So in John 14, 22, Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, How will you manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answers, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Right? So Jesus is making his home where? Not on a literal th throne. Right? But with those who love him. Right? with those who keep his word, which would be the Old Testament prophecies and Jesus' own gospel. And then he goes on to teach about the Holy Spirit right after this. Right, The purpose of the Holy Spirit was so that people would see this, this resurrection. So Colossians 3, verse 3 to 4. For you did die, and your life has been hid with Christ in God. Is this physical? No, right? The Coloss Colossian believers in Colossae, they died. They had been dead in Christ. They were now in a spiritual wilderness for 40 years. And and between Jesus' crucifixion and his um, and the final resurrection in AD 70. For you did die spiritually, and your life has been hid with Christ and God spiritually. So it was hidden, right? And then when would it be revealed? That would be when this fruit of the Spirit uh, comes alive. The fruit of the Spirit would reveal it. It would be revealed within believers to believers. Colossians 3 verse 4. When the Christ, our life. Right, Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if you're in Christ, technically you've been resurrected spiritually. And when Christ, our life, is manifested, right, they're talking about the same thing that would be in the saints. Then also we with him shall be manifested in glory. And this would be his second coming, which would be in glory. What did Jesus say about himself concerning the resurrection? John eleven twenty five. you guys can read this. Basically Jesus says he is the resurrection, right? And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? It's a question futurists should ask themselves. Right? If we believe in Jesus, then we're not going to die. Because sin has been dealt with. Right? And if sin hasn't been dealt with, then we should, we should die. Right? In a physical sense, if sin leads to death, then we actually haven't been forgiven. How much forgiveness do we actually have if uh, the death is physical? Second Corinthians three sixteen six to eighteen is speaks about the ministration of death, the ministration of life was being set up or built, constructed. It was uh, this house that was the believers, in which God would dwell with His Spirit in their midst forever, and this was happening as in a mirror, and you can see that in those verses for yourself. See how Job uses the term mirror in combination with clouds. That was made an expanse with him for the clouds. 
skies in the English Standard Version. Strong as a hard mirror. <laughs> I just think that's cool. That we could see ourselves in a mirror. That God's revealing to us uh, who we really are. As if looking up into the skies we can see it. Just like we're the light of the world. In Matthew 5. And then Deuteronomy 32. Uh, how the teaching of God, the like rain comes down from the clouds, just like the Holy Spirit is the rain, or uh, in James chapter 5, uh, pray that the Lord would bring the latter rains, and the latter rains would be uh, to produce the end result of the harvest, or the last three feast days, which were fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus is said to be the light of the world. We all know that the sun is the light of the world. So I just go on more about this here. That's basically what I just said. <laughs> um, and then there's like the rock that gave water to Moses. And Jesus is the rock. And now we're living stones. Or the, uh, the first century Christians were living stones. And they were being resurrected. Like out of a mustard seed that over time becomes the largest plant, right? So resurrection was a process. And it was growing up, Jesus planted the seed, and then it was growing up uh, to become the biggest plant in the garden in the first century. And then he would harvest that plant at the destruction of Jerusalem and bring them into his barn, and the wicked would be destroyed. So, back to 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gets his verse, Death Swallowed Up in Victory, from Isaiah 25, verse 7 to 8. I just want to remind you, this, this is an Old Testament prophecy. Jesus says in Matthew 25, he came to fulfill uh, the law and the prophets, and that not one jot and tittle would pass away till all is fulfilled. So, if this hasn't been fulfilled, then we still need to keep the Old Testament. Uh, laws and commands, every jot and tittle. We should be keeping all the feast days and everything. But the fact is, um, Jesus, or God destroyed, Jesus destroyed it at his second coming and destruction of Jerusalem because we don't have any more genealogy or Levit for the Levitical priesthood. So we can't really make those animal sacrifices anymore. And uh, that should be a sign to us that that heaven and earth system of the law of Moses passed away. So, so this mountain, he starts talking about this mountain in Isaiah 25. And that's the same mountain in Daniel 2.44 that would strike the statue and become the largest mountain in the whole earth. And uh, we see that similar to the commission, fulfilling of the commission at the end of the age in Colossians 1 verse 6 who is bearing fruit throughout the whole world in Isaiah 25 verse 7 he says he swallowed up the face of the wrapping that is wrapped over all the peoples and of the covering that is spread over all the nations this is the veil, the heaven and earth system that we enter through that we're stuck under until we enter into faith and to the most holy place. He swallowed up death and victory, a uh, tear from all, f all faces. Reproach of his people he turns aside from off the earth. Right, we see that language in Revelation 21, and people ask about that a lot. But I just encourage those people to read the whole chapter, uh, even in the literal translation and ask themselves if it's truly been fulfilled. And then it speaks about the salvation. And we know that no Christian perished in Jerusalem because they knew Jesus' prophecy about the end of the age. Right, the beginning of the chapter it talks about the fortified city being destroyed. Right, there was two major cities 
in in the Bible is the physical city of Jerusalem and the spiritual city, which is the spiritual Jerusalem, and uh, it's a it was going to be the new covenant. So which mountain would he swallow up death on? Well, in Second Corinthians three, it was the law of Moses that was the ministration of death. Right, Romans four fifteen. Sin is reckoned. Sin is not reckoned where there is no law. The law of Moses is the ministration of death. Right, I spoke on some of this already. And then you have the spiritual fulfillment of food, so you can understand the Feast of Abraham, how that was taking place. Uh, in Psalm 23, you have God saying, uh, King David saying, uh, you prepare a feast for me in the midst of my enemies. And we know that the last enemy was death. So this feast was being prepared and the fruit of the Spirit you could taste and see that the Lord is good. In Isaiah 24, we have a mini apocalypse. Isaiah 25, destruction of the city, death is swallowed up. Isaiah 26, resurrection, birth pangs of the great tribulation. In Matthew 24, salvation of Hebrews 9.28, and disclosure of the blood of the prophets. In Matthew 23.35, this is all context of Matthew 24, the destruction of Jerusalem. And the end of the Old Covenant age. The hope of Israel. Their hope was the same hope of that of Israel in the Old Testament. Acts 24.15 Having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, there's a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Right. So Paul has the same hope. Uh, Luke twenty four twenty five. Jesus is talking to the uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus, and he tells them about how it's necessary that Jesus should suffer, and then enter His glory. Right, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning Himself. Acts three twenty four. All the prophets who had spoken from Samuel and those who came after him proclaimed these days. So it wasn't a different time of days, but all those prophets were speaking of the first century days. Jesus made sure that they understood you see that Matthew thirteen fifty two, Amos 3, verse 7, God does nothing without revealing his plan. So I'm, I'm asking for partial preterists, where is the evidence of Jesus coming a third time um, as you expect him to in judgment? Or where is the evidence of these many comings of the Lord? Um, because Jesus, you can see everything he did, uh, fulfilled the prophecy in the Old Testament. He was born, that was in the Old Testament. Uh, he started his ministry when he was 30 years old, that was in the Old Testament. He was baptized and went in the wilderness for 40 days, that's in the Old Testament. So everything... Uh, he did, and the Christians did in the first century, was prophesied in the Old Testament, uh, except what partial predators say is these uh, fut future sort of things to us, which would extend the Old Covenant laws and commands uh, into our time as well. Because uh, the first century is to fulfill all things. <clears throat> we should remember that Jesus always made sure his disciples understood what he was talking about, and that the blind were the first century Jews, fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah, being blind to the truth. Right. So certain churches, like World Mission Society, Church of God, they, they like, since they think the book of Revelation is written later than it was, they think the subject matter is not to do with the destruction of Jerusalem, but to do with the destruction of false churches. And that makes sense if it was written when it, they say it was written. But then they get to say that 
uh, these false churches are also the blind. Well, the blind was part of a fulfillment of prophecy, and by saying that that's true, it is to say that the old covenant is still in effect. Coming of Christ. We are to be consistent with time statements. We cannot divide the coming of the kingdom, coming of Jesus, full establishment of the new covenant, wedding banquet, feast of Abraham, destruction of the city, invisible nature, glorification, purification, last judgment, great tribulation, fulfillment of all things, and the law. Um, many of the resurrection texts in the New Testament are referring to Daniel 12, 1-10. In fact, Jesus quotes this chapter in the parable of the weeds and wheat at the end of the age, which would be fulfilled at the end of the age. Um, verse 2 and 10, so you guys can read through this. Seventy AD, the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed, fulfilling Jesus' iron furnace in his parables. So the iron furnace in Deuteronomy was that was Egypt was used to describe Egypt. I think it's Deuteronomy chapter four. The uh, mystery of God was to be the godliness that comes from the free gift of righteousness, which is Christ in you, the glory we now have through the faith in God's word, and we can all. Hope to be like him, order to reign as kings in this life. Right? In order to reign as kings in this life. So that whenever I emphasized stuff, right, it was my work. I didn't there's a lot of stuff that wasn't emphasized in the Bible. So basically I just wanted to have this on my YouTube channel for you guys to uh have a resource and well, hopefully I can get you the PowerPoint itself. If you want to share it with people, go ahead. This is uh, completely free, and I'm just trying to provide resources for people who are asking questions, because there's a lot of cults out there that will easily manipulate people into thinking they have to work to attain this sort of righteousness that's already been fulfilled, this sort of resurrection. Thanks, guys, for watching. Uh, that's it. That's it for now.